I'm Al Frenzel, and uh, I am speaking today, though, as Colonel Retired Al Frenzel, the director for the Oahu Council for Army Downsizing. On the 27th of June of this year, just almost three months next week, the Army announced that uh, it was di directed based on budgetary constraints to downsize its forces by as many as 130,000, but a minimum of 100,000. And that's quite a lot. That's the biggest uh, wartime down, or the biggest downsizing since World War II. And an uh, announcement went out, and not many people heard it. Uh, I received an email sometime in August, and I almost didn't even open it because the subject was weird. It was the uh, special program programmatic environmental assessment for the Army, which didn't mean anything to me. And I had other things to do and was seconds from deleting it. But I opened it up and I said, oh my god, this is unbelievable that the Army is making this decision. I knew they were going to, they announced a year ago to make some cuts. And Schofield was on the hit to lose 8,000 folks. But this announcement doubled the, uh, the, the impact. So uh, I even let that rest with me for about a week till it absorbed in and said, oh my god, what a wonderful opportunity. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to show you some slides that are small for, for your purposes, unfortunately. I printed them for Brian Schatz's office, who I and a group uh, met with uh, last Friday. But uh, that's OK. The primary up here is a means for me to remember what to say. So again, I'm a, a director of like-minded organizations. And I'm asking to join me uh, in this you know, effort to convince uh, our people of Hawaii, and particularly our congressional delegation, that army downsizing is not such a bad thing. When you first talk about, and whenever I, I mention to somebody, you know, take David Iggy for example, I had a conversation with him and I, I told him, you know, did you hear about the, uh, the, the announcement that the Army's going to downsize by almost 130,000? And his reaction was like most people, oh my God, we can't have that. And first of all, he didn't even know about it, but secondly, and none of them really did at the time, and I'm not sure they all of them know now. But his first reaction was, oh my god, we can't have that. And I said, time out, time out. Think about what happens if we would allow it. I know there's an economic piece to this. There are payroll and other things, and we can talk about that. But the value of these installations that they occupy, and the fact they've got to be cut anyways, from a taxpayer, taxpayer standpoint, they're going to be cut somewhere in the United States. Uh, if you, if from a taxpayer standpoint, wouldn't it be nice to cut them in the most expensive place where they're currently based? So anyway, so, so uh, uh, although I'm the director, my intent of, of this council is not to be a board member or a decision maker or, uh, you know, the leader. My, I'm as a director. I'm just trying to be the facilitator to get the as much membership in this organization as possible so that we have a lot of influence and power over the legislators. Okay. So uh, now why, why, just because I'm an Army colonel doesn't mean I have any qualifications to speak to this issue. But it just so happens that my last assignment uh, was at the U United States Army War College at Carlisle Barracks, and I was faculty instructor there. And one of, and I was in, happened to be in the department that taught how the Army sizes its forces. And I was a lesson author, and I was an exercise director for uh, having the students prepare scenarios based on con budget constraints we we would give them of, to redesign their own forces. And they w and we're talking all joint forces, Marines, Navy. Uh, Army and the Air Force. Uh, so I did that for two years, and I, th I did develop some skill along the way. So it's not like I don't have experience for this. So at part of that lesson, or part of my department's lesson uh, plan, was to teach the Joint Strategic Planning System and how systems are exist in, in the joint service structure, department of defense structure, that allow the services to 
link the national security strategy that's developed by uh, the president, the administration, and, and the National Security Council, and, and translate the national security strategy into the national defense strategy, because the national security strategy is done by multiple of, of agencies. It's not just the Department of Defense. It's a, you know, the, the Department of Defense is politics by just another means. So there's many agencies that are involved in the security of the United States. But for the purposes of the, the military, we look at the national defense strategy and then even combine that down to national military strategy and how operational forces are, are weaponized, are trained and positioned and how they you know, serve those strategies to achieve the nation's interests. So one key document though of that is what's called the Quadrennial Defense Review. And it gets published every four years, and it just recently got published in January-ish. It's not dated, but it's 2014 document. It's what prescribes from the Department of Defense to tell what the services, how they're supposed to organize, and what their in-strength and weapon systems are allowed to be based on, theoretically, it should be based on the threat, okay? In reality, it's more based on what the budget can support. But um, we'll talk about that in a second. But, and then from the Quadrennial Defense Review, which was released early this year, the Army uh, released what's called, what I mentioned to you before, what came into me in the email, the Supplemental Programmatic Environmental Assessment on Army Restructuring for 2020. And what that means by 2020 is, Department of Defense wants it to be a done deal by 2020. That means decisions made and soldiers uh, um, let go, let go uh, or attrited out or whatever, various means that will be used to downsize them. That's not very long from now. Uh, so now I talked about the Quadrennial Defense Review. This, is, this document actually tells the services what to prepare for. So during the Cold War, what they prepared for, what we prepared for, was the ability to fight two major theater wars. Theoretically, um, Europe was the big enemy at the time, the Russian bear, and somewhere in the Pacific. And a small scale, small scale contingency. You know, you've heard like Grenada, or the Panama event we had, Urgent Fury, okay? But when the, when the wall came down and the, and the Cold War ended, there was no, no need to fight the big Russian bear anymore, so the strategy changed to fight two near simultaneous major theater wars and one small scale contingency. So a little bit less, and we had a peace dividend at the time. You may remember that. The peace dividend might have been larger, uh, but the Gulf War got in the way. Nevertheless, now, within, now with the, based on the QDR 2014 and guidance from the administration, et cetera, the mission is to fight one large-scale multi-phase campaign. That's the way they word it, read that, to be able to fight one major theater war, okay? Maybe not even that intense, but, and to have one other event that, that tried to delay a problem somewhere else. They, they use some weird wording in the, in the sentence that they describe this mission, but bottom line, it's either to de deny or hold or to delay another regional problem. So in my analysis, this one and one is, is about half the size uh, or even, even more than half the size of a two-in-one. So, but because of this new mission, and I do get arguments all the time of saying we shouldn't cut, we shouldn't cut, and my argument, and I'm told I should fight these cuts. Well, that's not my battle, I'm not in this particular arena. That's someone else's battle, and there are people fighting that battle. My battle is that the, the department, of, that the Army, is, which has had a wartime, a recent high of 570, it's about 550, 550,000 right now to go down to as low as 450, and even the wording says 440, which is 110,000. 
but and, and then there's a, a reduction for the National Guard and a reduction for the U.S. Army Reserve. Fair, fairly small reductions, but now, but I told you 130,000 could be cut. And that's based on if sequestration levels, remember sequestration, we, it's, yeah, they kind of delayed it till two, FY16. If that comes back to haunt us again, which it could, and from there on, then there, the Army's instructed to go to 420,000, and that's where the 130,000 comes from, and that's a huge cut. So, uh, so I talked about going to 450 or as low as 420, but the impact on us in Oahu is that, you know, when Senator Inouye was alive, no one believed we, even with that 8,000 we were identified for, that it would ever happen because he had a lot of power. He, could, he was in charge of the Armed Forces Senate Committee, so he could tell, uh, he can make a lot of decisions. And that's, oh, by the way, where decisions are made. Uh, decisions of where the Army puts its soldiers and its bases, et cetera, it's not made by the Army, not made by Department of Defense. They make recommendations, but it's your congressmen and your senators that decide. You know, a lot of times I, it, it, it offends me a little when I go to some meetings and the military is present briefing on Oahu and, and anti-militarists or sovereignty people will point their fingers and say, get out of here, get out of here, and treat the Army like crap. And they're not here because they want to be. They're here because they're told to be, and they're here because Senator Inouye and others put them here. So, so don't blame them. Anyways, that's just an aside. Uh, but... But this recent announcement and the fact that Senator Inouye and Senator Akaka are no longer with us puts us in a very weak position politically and uh, Hawaii is on the list to lose 16,000, let me talk chapter, Fort Chapter, to lose 3,800 uh, soldiers, soldiers and civilians on Fort Chapter and 16,000 at Schofield Barracks. So here's a, here's a recap of that. So of s there's 7,400 at Shafter now, approximately cuts of 3,800 would leave a balance of about 3,600. Schofield Barracks is at about 18,000 and change. Cuts leaving would leave about 2,441 soldiers and civilians. This is the, the hit list, and I'm gonna give out a flyer at the end of this with the list of these units that are on the hook to lose, lose that are on the hook to potentially lose these, these soldiers. The Army identified many more uh, places than it needs to make these cuts because they know they're gonna run into political, I mean, th there's gonna be p people politically that will win and fight their cuts in their backyard. Fort Bragg, for instance, and Fort Hood, for instance, they're telling people they are not vulnerable. They're not gonna lose anybody but they're on the list, you know? So I don't, they have a lot of chutzpah to say that, and they're probably right. But, uh, but the facts are that of these, these geographic areas, some are gonna lose soldiers, some are not. Now, worst case scenario, and we can talk about that at the end, worst case scenario is if some lost a proportionate amount across the board. Let's say they took half of this and half of this and half of that, for instance, Let's say we only lost half in Oahu. Well, not only do we get the bad part, which is losing their payroll, which is probably the only advantage we get from having them here, one of the few advantages, but such a large quantity remaining behind would not allow us to recover any facilities whatsoever. So it could be in the Army's best interest to only say I'll take some from here and some from here and some from here and we don't have to do any base closures, we don't have to do any environmental cleanup, and we make our, our cuts. That would be worst case scenario. Hopefully it's not played that way. But nevertheless, on this list, for instance, Texas, Fort Bragg, North, North Carolina. Could you imagine losing the 82nd Airborne? That's never gonna happen. Uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 101st uh, Air Mobile Division. It's not gonna happen. Uh, Fort Carson, Fort Drum, Fort Drum, Waterville, New York, where the Fort Drum, huh? Watertown. 
Watertown, sorry, thank you. That's the only game in town. Uh, and New York has a lot of powerful politicians. I don't see that going away. Uh, so here's U.S. Army Garrison Hawaii for 16, and then we're on the list over here, U.S. Army Garrison Hawaii for 3,800. And then, you know, everything from the large units losing their entire divisions, basically 16,000 is their, di their division size fighting force. And then these other, other activities losing small quantities, but these are training bases. These are with small populations in the first place. And they have a training mission, so I can't, you know, I don't know how they will do their missions. Okay, so what I'm proposing as the, the Council for Army Downsizing is that we embrace those cuts. We say that's a good thing for Oahu and Hawaii, and we ask that the re it return Schofield Barracks, Wheeler Army Airfield, Makua Valley Training Area, Dillingham Army, uh, Dillingham Military Reservation, and well, we would we would get Koi Koi Pass with with Schofield Barracks, but I want to go a little step further. I want unimpeded access so all of you can use Lululule Naval Road or Army Road or whatever we're calling it, you know, and you you have the ability to use that at any time you want to drive over the pass, whether it's an emergency or just avoiding traffic or to drive over and look at the beautiful view out the pass. So to recap, I'm saying Schofield and Weir Army Airfield, Makua Valley, Dillingham Military Reservation, which isn't much, but that's some prime real estate. It's not a very big, big area. It doesn't include the airfield because that's been already turned over, but it includes beachfront property and, a, and some area behind the airfield. And then this is the map here that I provided of uh, Schofield Barracks here, Wheeler Army Airfield here. So to get an idea where so the, the training area for Schofield is here, and this little squiggly thing here, that is the Koi Koi Pass and the road through Lululei. In fact, it doesn't even go all the way to Farrington, which would be, Farrington is probably about right there. <laughs> okay, so I listed here some advantages, and if you like the idea, I, uh, I ask for your help in other advantages and other repurposing uses for these bases. You know, I've, I've thought of a few, but not, and there's no way that I thought of all of them. But what exists up there right now is, first of all, 38,000 family members and soldiers live at Schofield Barracks and Wheeler Army Airfield. Imagine uh, taking our, uh, first of all, I w on our homeless, I wouldn't give them housing. I would give them the soldier barracks, and I would like—I would propose setting up something like the Army Vets Corporation runs, and that they manage the life cycle of a homeless from off the street to rehabilitation to a job, etc. Okay, and then as far as family housing goes, there's a variety of family housing. There is uh, townhouse, condo type housing. And then there is single family housing, and there is officer housing, and there, so there's a, very, there's a pecking order of quality and size of housing there. But all of it is either new or, brand, or re recently renovated. So it's, they're beautiful facilities. But you know, a combination of actually uh, homeless or qualifying homeless families that maybe graduate from a program uh, to, to receive some kind of work, work related, uh, and I'm not in the housing business, so you know, here I'm just you know, throwing out some ideas you can, you can figure out better than me. But, but families that receive maybe some of the, the lower end housing, you know, homeless families that are in transition to getting jobs and, and, and rehabilitation, to some of the higher end housing going to our beneficiaries on the Department of Hawaiian Homelands waiting list, or in some of that, in, or possibly to other qualifying low-income people where they, no kidding, could get a low-income house. <coughs> Not low-income house in Hawaii, from a, a government's point of view, is two hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. Okay, now I'm talking low-income house where they can make, w move in easily under a hundred thousand, and maybe less. Something within their e economic means, and they pay for their uh, long-term mortgage or lease. Whatever, but bottom line is, it's the, the housing alone 
on these two bases was worth about $2 billion, okay? Now then there's also large industrial facilities, retail and wholesale locations, a hospital and dental clinic, airfield and tower operations, fire, two fire stations, a huge educational facility with, with a beautiful library, elementary and middle schools, office buildings, post office, lodging, you know, there's a hotel up there, and that's a hotel-like operation. There's uh, clubs and restaurants. There's the second access I mentioned for Leeward Coast residents. Recreational facilities, important Hawaiian cultural sites. Uh, a population reduction alone, just the 5.1% would ra be raptured off of Oahu. Now, you know, <laughs> okay. may maybe not to heaven, but somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> So, and, that, and, the, and the demand on public services and the less traffic and less students in our high schools uh, and, or in, in grade schools, et cetera, is an, an advantage in itself. Why you want um, commercial folks, uh, chamber of commerce folks, need to realize that all those military seeking state and city and county benefits, whether it be security or police or registering their cars or voting or whatever they go to the satellite city hall there for, they have to provide. And uh, when guys like me and are in active duty and, and, in, and assigned to locations like that, we're usually a resident somewhere in our home state and we're not, A, we're not voters and B, we're not paying state taxes. Okay, so that's a big revenue that we lose. And all, oh, by the way, no one is playing real, um, not real estate taxes, what do you call it? Property, Property taxes. Okay, and more affordable housing on, and more importantly, off base. Because in, as an Army colonel, I got, in addition to my pay, my, my normal pay, I would be given 3,500 a month extra to buy housing. Or, and, 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 it, and, it, and it goes down from there, right? So, but even, yeah, a sergeant probably gets about $2,500 to help them buy or rent housing. And imagine what that does to increase the cost of rents and the cost of uh, buying a house. So that disappears as well. But nevertheless, there, there's, these are kind of like what's there right now, and then I can use help with, it, with ideas of, of what they could be used for. For instance, I'll give you two ideas. One is, instead of U8 Central Oahu, or wait, U, excuse me, U8 West Oahu, which has gone nowhere fast in, a long, in 15, 20 years. They do have facilities there, I guess, now. But imagine instead U8 Central Oahu, that where facilities already exist, research facilities via the library, but we could drive over the pass to Lulu Lay and over, over the hill, and we could go to school easy. S North Shore could go to school easily. Central Oahu could go to shore, school easily. Eva could go to school easily. And guess what? They wouldn't be going east-west on, on the highway, messing it up. OK. Now, yeah, I can't read this, but uh, no, I'll read this real quickly. Uh, there's a, and what it says, and this is the message I'm trying to tell who will listen to me in our congressional delegations. And remember, we got uh, Schatz's office, who we met with Friday. We didn't meet with him, but we met with his uh, senior policy advisor, uh, Dale Hahn. And her first comment was, you, sh you know, Shaft, uh, Wahiwa's already been here. We said, okay, that's good, but you know, there are only 16,000 people, and the advantage of this is to 800 and some thousand, and actually my number of 800,000 is a little low. It's really more like about 11, 1,100,000 that live on Oahu. Uh, so the, the needs of the, the many outweigh the 16,000 at, at Wahiwa, and really of that 16,000, probably only, you know, I, a small percentage are in business there and getting business off of, off of the military, very small percentage. Uh, but nevertheless, so we talked to her. We're on the schedule to meet with uh, Maisie Hirono's military liaison next week. And uh, Tulsi Gabbard has ignored us so far. And uh, Mark Takai is not in office and he's against 
to do and we've asked, we've asked ourselves to be seen by them. But nevertheless, what I want to tell them is if they think they have the in a way clout to retain the Army forces on Oahu and they attempt to compete against more senior legislators that are in Congress and representing the other states, and the other states are a total of 19 states identified to absorb these cuts. We're one, so there's 18 other states. The legislators in those other 18 states have much more power than our four freshmen have. And, and they think they're gonna fight that, and they tell their constituents, I'm gonna go fight and I'm gonna save the Army, and they lose this fight. What kind of face will they have when they come back into town for re-election two and four years from now? I'm, pur I'm purporting to them that and they can throw their careers on this, and, but they're gonna lose. And hopefully what I'll do is entice them to just even, if they're against the ideas, keep their mouth shut, okay? Because that achieves the same effect. <laughs> okay, now, state spaces on the chopping block, they're on the, not on the list to the right because there's no list here, but bottom line is the list I'll hand to you. Uh, the political power base in these other states is huge compared to what our freshmen will have. And also, I'll say, some naive folks believe the cuts will not happen. They say, no, this is not going to happen. Uh, something will change it. The only thing that will change this, and it's a slim possibility, is a conflict in the world. Because it did slow down the peace dividend after the, the wall fell. It's your military industrial complex at work trying to defend its, its, its lives. So, but I don't think that that is very high. Nevertheless, uh, as far as the QDR is concerned, DOD is locked. They already accept, and they have admitted in writing, they're, they're going to lose, and they're going to have to go to 450000 So the only energy they spend on this right now is to fight going to 420. They say the difference of 30,000 will break the Army and it'll be not, it won't be functional can't perform its missions. So I'll, I'll, I'll give them that, all right? If they want to defend that 30,000, it's still 100,000 cuts. That's a lot. So to our new, new congressional delegation, instead of fighting this opportunity, let's embrace it and ask the current administration. Here's the key. All the other states are fighting this right now. And remember that program act, programmatic <laughs> systemic uh, uh, pr programmatic environmental assessment that they published? There was a deadline to respond to that of, of you know, mid-August, okay? My council responded, and you can see my writing on the internet of what our response was. Uh, about four of my friends or contacts responded. I don't know how many other may have responded from the state of Hawaii, but the responses from the other states was 40,000, okay? 40,000 against the cuts in their backyards. Ours were cut or in favor of the cuts. So imagine Hawaii being the only state to embrace these cuts and go to President Obama while he's still in office go to Congress, but particularly President Obama, because he has, is, he has a lot of influence on why these cuts happened, and uh, go to him and say, look, we're not going to fight you. We're not going to waste all this energy. What we want, what we'd like, we won't admit to him how well we're getting, you know, we're uh, benefiting from this opportunity, but what we need is a, um, and what's my wording again? an economic transition assistance package to help us over the next five, 10 years. President Obama, it's gonna be tough on us. We've got uh, communities supporting the, the, this military and all these businesses are gonna be lost, and people are gonna suffer. So we'd like to have a $5 billion, I don't pick a number, uh, financial transition assistance package to help us with this issue before you get out of office. I think that's, I think that's at least we should ask at least we should leverage our willingness to embrace these cuts because, oh, by the way, President Obama, we're going to save Department of Defense so much money because it's so expensive for them to be here. Okay. Uh, okay. I didn't talk about why I didn't think the Army was strategic here. It doesn't, that wasn't part of this scenario. But 
I'm more than happy to talk about that because that I've run into two things. Right, we'll talk about that now. So the formal presentation is over. Now it's question time, but I'm going to talk about three questions I normally get. The first question is, but the Army is so strategic here, and, <laughs> and the, uh, they're here to defend Oahu. What would we do? No. Yeah, okay. The Army's not here to defend Oahu. The Army is here on paper to defend the interests of the United States in the Pacific Theater. Okay, but here's the problem with that. The Army, doesn't, the Army needs cargo ships to move their equipment and or cargo aircraft. Okay, those two assets don't exist on Oahu. You go down there and look for them, they're not there. The cargo ships have to come from the West Coast. There are eight C-1, um, there are eight brand new huge ar uh, cargo aircraft that's in, in a way positioned at, at Shaft, or at, uh, sorry, at uh, Hickam Air Force Base. But of any one time, there's maybe two here, and their mission isn't to stay and stand here ready to move the Army. Uh, of the, all of the uh, C-17 aircraft, that's the nomenclature for these, they're, they're all over the world doing missions. So when, a ar when an Army unit needs to deploy, first of all, it doesn't go by air. It's too expensive, uh, and it takes too long. For one maneuver brigade, and there's two br maneuver brigades up there right now, Without their support equipment, without supplies, without logistics, takes 300 aircraft flights to move one brigade. Okay, so you, you don't normally see the Army move by air. When we moved it to Iraq, it took months. It took a year, actually, to get all our forces to Iraq, all our logistics situated, and be able to fight, to be able to move forward and do the mission. And that's not unlike what would be the scenario with Schofield. So if you're gonna move Schofield, uh, units out of Schofield, it is quicker logistically to move them from the United States because that's where the bulk of the aircraft are and that's, in bulk, uh, and that's where our cargo ships are. Well, isn't Fort Lewis already prepared to do this it, Fort, job? Fort Lewis, Washington, yeah. Fort Lewis McCord joint, air, joint Base is on the hit list. It has everything there to do this. So we can get uh, the division out of Fort Lewis in anywhere in the Pacific twice as fast as we can get them out of Oahu. So basically, the forces on Oahu are isolated. They're here as a legacy force from World War II because we never let them go. And Senator Inouye doubled them in size because it brought money and weapon systems in the Stryker Brigade, et cetera, into Oahu, which means money and, and a hell of a lot of construction which, oh, by the way, the construction, both housing and facilities for industrial facilities, the construction error of the last 20 years at Schofield is over. They rebuild everything. There's, there's, they have everything they need. Uh, we're also related to isolation of the Army. The Army doesn't have the ability to do forced entry operations. In other words, you go to a location, and either fight over the shore or you enter their harbors and take them over. The, you know, the old uh, amphibious operations of uh, Normandy, et cetera, that capability doesn't exist in the Army. Okay? It exists in the Marines, and the Marines at Kaneohe and the Marines at Okinawa have that capability, and they are our strategic forces in the Pacific. So what we are paying now as taxpayers, we're paying Army to pretend it's doing it, and we're on Oahu, and we're paying the Marines that is doing it. Um, okay, and the other argument I get is, but the military did such a poor job of downsizing at Barber's Point, it's horrible at Barber's Point, that I hate to see all these good facilities get deteriorated if we turn it over. Okay, well, Barber's Point was screwed up for a variety of reasons. Uh, we can go into that, but to save time, it was the, the transition was not managed. Okay, it wasn't managed like Fort Ord, Fort Ord was managed, which I can let Rodlin testify to, provide testimony on on how that how that transition occurred, and it was a very successful transition. So, in regards to this facility, uh, we will not repeat that mistake. 
first of all, we'll, we'll demand an, a, com a commission or a board be appointed of community members and leaders to prevent it from happening. And we'll do some kind of, we'll have four years while the downsizing has occurred to manage the transition of this to uh, the state of Hawaii. Okay, that's a common question I get. There's one more, but I'll, I'll remember it. Anyways, are there any questions? We yeah. did do Ford Ward in four years. We started 1940, 1991, and we completed in 1995. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the old Ford Ward, uh, Monterey Bay, Monterey. California. Ford Ward was the basic training camp of the United States Army. There were two in the United States. We were the West Coast. Any man that joined the Army or was drafted into the Army and was sent to the West Coast went to Fort Ord. It was a basic training camp. Then it became the home of the seven. Overnight, our rents went from $400 a month for a three-bedroom house to $1,200 a month because the military didn't have the housing, so they took over all the housing and all the surrounding towns. When it occurred, we had the same reaction from people that were, oh my God, our town is going to die. Well, if you go back to the Monterey Peninsula today, a town called Marina, a town called Sand City, and a town called Seaside are all doing much better today than they were when the Army was there. Because they now have residents that lived there for 20 years instead of employed there for two who don't give a rat's patoot about the merchants and don't keep the merchants in business. Any merchant that is worth their salt can stay in business if they have a clientele. They now have the clientele because the people now can afford to buy the homes that were on Fort Ord. All the price of housing in that whole area and those three towns has come down to affordability we had the same problem on the Monterey Peninsula. Military was our number one industry. Hospitality was our number two industry. Military is now gone. Hospitality is the industry of the Monterey Peninsula. Most people that work in the industry or support the industry cannot live in Pebble Beach or Monterey or Carmel, but they can live in Marina and Seaside and uh, Sand City, and that's where they are. And they have created these marvelous, affordable, middle-class communities where the government isn't subsidizing the rent that was being paid by military people. So the rents have had to come down and the price of housing has had to come down to make it affordable communities. And the entire peninsula of Monterey is doing by far better than they were doing the 70 years that Camp Ord and Fort Ord were in existence. So it can be done. It can be done in four years. It can be done correctly. Our firing ranges were out on the most beautiful parsh, partial parcel of land that faced Monterey Bay. And the military was forced to bring in a piece of equipment that is available that took all of that land and ran it through this humongous piece of equipment. It sterilized the ground. It fired off any live ammunition. And it gathered all the trash ammunition. And it is now hiking paths, biking paths, picnic grounds, and certain and uh, sail surfing areas. There's also uh, hotels out there now and all kinds of wonderful things that bring people in. And they now can go on this land. Some of the most beautiful views in the world are right there. And they aren't firing ranges any longer. It can all be done. This commission of local people and I was part of this commission of local people on the Monterey Peninsula. We accomplished it with a gentleman.
gentleman by the name of Leon Panetta, who was our state representative. Leon and Sylvia live out in Carmel Valley. He's a rancher, but he was uh, the he was in the state Congress or the United States Congress for 16 years, and then he went with Bill Clinton as his chief of staff. Chief of staff. And um, Leon was the backbone of us getting to the federal government and getting all the things we wanted. We had the University of California Monterey Bay there. We have um, discount houses there. All these big discount shopping centers that they create. Whole big shopping center, big box stores. Um, we used to have to drive all the way to Salinas to go to a flea market. Um, so, that, I mean, it, it can be done with the right attitude and the right people supporting you. And we need, Barber's Point failed because our four federal representatives failed us. They knew for 15 years that Barber's Point was closing. And Annoy didn't do a damn thing to save Barber's Point. Not one damn thing did that man do to save Barber's Point. And so we end up with an, a base of trash that has been totally desecrated because of this. And we don't have to have that. We can have a marvelous community here, and we don't have to have Ho'opili built on the middle of the Eva Plain and destroy all that prime agricultural land. It's already built. The housing is already there. We don't need to build 8,500 homes on the Eva Plain when they're sitting there already done. Okay, I got a question up front. Yeah, um, you, t you were talking about downsizing. What, how, how do you get from downsizing to guaranteeing these facilities close because there's still X number of army here? Right, that's a good question. Uh, the residual amount of 2,441 that would remain on Schofield and Shafter, I'm proposing get relocated and centralized at Shafter because they're losing 3,800. So I'm saying the Army should yeah. centralize all its function right. at Shafter. Right. In fact, if you look at my uh, response to the EA, I'm purporting that, that Schofield lose 22,000 people because the, the number that they selected was 16,000, excuse me, the two maneuver brigades, everything above that was an arbitrary figure. 40, 40, 70% of this. Uh, does it? Yeah, that's a good question. I was 22,000 overall, but there's 18,400 there. And that, and they're saying 16 from there, leaving 2,441. It was totally, ar well, they also did an arbitrary cap on every installation and said no installation should lose more than 16,000. So I said that cap should be eliminated. eliminated. <laughs> but no, it's very easily for the Army to consolidate on chapter and give in a seize. Now, if they're able to put a huge force there, let's say they only get the cut of 8,000, they'll still need everything here and we'll get nothing. And so that would yeah. be horrible. Okay. No, it but has to be done correctly. And we even insisted that they keep a commissary on Fort Ord for all the retired military that right. live on the Monterey Peninsula. Right. So that is where some of the civilian military employees were kept to work. So let me recap on this map here, which is available at my website, www.oc4ad.com. It's listed on that sheet I handed out, but it may look small on the computer, but you can drill in, it's a high def image, you can drill in and see it as easily as this. You just have to scroll left a lot and scroll up and down a lot. But nevertheless, this H2 highway coming up, and this ends here because this is Wahiwa up here, Wilson Lake up here, 
Uh, what do they call this road? I can't read. But uh, anyways, the H2 ends here and it goes here and goes to North Shore. Uh, this is uh, Schofield Barracks. This is Wheeler Army Airfield. This is the airfield here. Okay, this housing here was just built within the last 10 years. Okay, everything in red is housing. So here, this, this is uh, old uh, uh, Wheeler housing. This, is, this here is old Schofield housing, but this is new. But this area right here, this big area, that used to be a 90-acre golf course. That used to be Kalakawa Golf Course. And because it is so expensive, to pay that extra housing stipend, or used, what was the word you used? Uh, anyways, uh, extra allowance. E extra allowance, yeah, housing. Uh, housing allowance, and they were paying millions and millions to have soldiers off base. It was it was cheaper a month. It, it was cheaper to r turn this golf course into fam family housing, and all these are. Uh, thousands of new homes. So that, so there's also industrial areas. There's also huge barracks. Remember the movie From Here to Eternity? That's where you know it was filmed in one of these quads. Uh, a lot of space for U.S. Army vets or some other contractor to come in and manage their homeless. Uh, imagine between the the range facilities out here, the the jungle type environment or tropical rainforest type environment, which is used a lot in the film is industry. A lot of films are are shot in those locations. Imagine some of these hangars here being converted to Hawaii Film Studio. Um, okay. So anyway, you had a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned co uh, using Koli Koli cast. Is that open now? Yeah. No. 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 But you're you're, you're taking it. Yeah. Away. I'm demanding that the that the, the Navy repair it. Yeah, the bridge okay. is broken. Yeah. I knew it was closed. But yeah. And another thing, um, I was going going by uh, that housing on Harvest Point that they're going to turn into homeless housing. There's mm -hmm. a lot of empty, and they're going to work on that. I know because it's already fenced off with black. They're going to remodel that also homeless. Right. Right. Some of that's it has to be torn down though because it's in such bad condition. Yeah. That's yeah. not what they said in the newspaper, but I see that it's, it's, there's a lot of it over there. Right. Well, right. Well, I know they're going to take the barracks facilities that were burned, and you drive by them, and the, the structure's still there. Yes. They're just going to rebuild those and, and uh, renovate them. But there's some family homes that are just totally falling apart. There weren't many. The Navy knew for 15 years that it was going to downsize. And they didn't put any money or investment to repair or build any capital improvements. So we in, we didn't inherit inherit much with Barber's Point. Well, the thing is, they could put uh, plenty of housing there instead of in the in, in, in that good farmland. I mean, there's lots of land. There's lots there. of land. It's empty. Yeah. There's nothing there. I agree. Thank you. You're, you're first. You had a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is the first time I've heard any of this. Um, Outside of writing to congressmen, what can we do to raise community awareness and help change opinions? Uh, your friends. Uh, networking. Network networking. I, the, you mentioned a, a great point, though, that's in our favor, is the fact that this isn't talked a lot. No. Uh, means that the, the, the leaders that are against this don't even want to mention it in Hawaii because it's a hot button issue. There was an article in the newspaper, one article. There was uh, one op-ed recently by Wahiwa. And oh, by the way, Wahiwa did an op-ed about three weeks ago and there were six comments made. Not one comment was in support of Wahiwa. Sorry, what's Wahiwa? <laughs> the oh, Wahiwa city. city. All right. Yeah. It's the it's a city right outside of Schofield. Okay. But where, where is it located? Uh, actually, it's, yeah, right over here. Yeah. In fact, there's a lake over here. Part of Waiwa is there. Part of some of the homes in Waiwa are even right there. Yeah. But it is. What? <laughs> that off ramp takes you right into Waiwa. This is about. This here is about 
70% of Schofield. It's actually more. It's the fire bases, the, the fire ranges that, that this gentleman has his next question on. Well, this down in here. This is uh, private land. Okay, and now where, where's the road that we go through? Well, this is. Oh, uh, Coley Coley Pass, you mean? Coley Pass. It's yeah. over oh. here to your far left. Yeah. Let me get let me get my cane, which I do need. Not showing on the. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Let me go to this one instead. The reason why it's not shown on there is because I'd have to have it go four more panels. Uh, so right here, this is what's shown here on the board. So, Coley Coley Pass is right about here, but the road that goes from the pass through Lulule Weapon State Naval Supply, whatever they're calling themselves now, ammo dump, ammo dump <laughs> goes goes through here. No, all, all, all of this and some more here, but here I'm only asking for the road. Okay, because this is Navy, this is owned by the Navy, right here. You're asking for the state to take it over, or is this going to be a Hawaiian home plan, or what? Okay, fate, that's an excellent question, too. Uh, I don't have the perfect answer for it, but what happens is part of if the, if the cuts are approved, which let's call that phase one, then we demand to go into base realignment and closure procedures. It's called BRAC. And then a, a Congress decides to approve the BRAC and what the parameters are for the BRAC. And as part of the base realignment and closure procedures, they turn everything over to the state of Hawaii, the, the, low, the next governmental agency and then the state will decide what to do with it and then we that's phase two or three and there's a combination of things that would occur some of it would be leased out some of it would be sold some of it would still be occupied by some federal activities but th because of this situation here a large majority of it would would be go to th whatever the state decides to use it now as far as the ranges are concerned uh, those have to transition to? Well, they don't have to. The Hawaii National Guard could come on board and say they have to have those. Um, and they could defend keeping them. The reason I ask this is I'm a member of the Schofield Rod and Gun Club. Right. And the Army lets us use their ranges on yeah. weekends. And we really need more ranges on this island because mm -hmm. all that stuff is run by. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. It's like being uh, run by KGB yeah. or something. Yeah. <laughs> far away too. And yeah, right yeah. now, only military or retired military or civil service yep. can use these yep. ranges. They're yep. not open to the public. Yeah. See, I, I purport to you it's that that small portion, it's only a small part of everything there, that it stay a rifle range for your type of, um, what, what kind of use. Uh, but that it, it can turn, that it should be open to the public. As yeah, the exactly. Yeah. And it become an economic enterprise yeah. so so what you so you're you're getting to use it for you're getting to use it for free right now so you might have to join some kind of membership yeah. Yeah. But that's what they also did at Fort Ord the two black horse and bayonet golf courses were both turned over and opened up to the general public and they are both under the leadership of contractors that go in and run golf courses and they are magnificent golf courses We've even had so there's revenue the revenue makers AT here too. Five hundred for uh, army in the whole country. Five fifty. Five something. Yeah. Okay, in the whole country. Okay, and but for Hawaii, the 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 number is nineteen thousand okay. eight hundred. <coughs> and where do they go then? The, well, the reason why they're being cut is because the army can't afford them. Well, they can't so afford them. So it's attrition. Attri yeah. It's attrition. Oh, they, attrition. They won't recruit as many. No, no. Not yeah, recruitment will go down. Okay. Now recruiting won't go down much because what the Army has to have is young people. Yeah. And so they rely on a, a fresh young recruits. But, but uh, a lot of people will get early, offered early retirement. Oh, offer Some, or yeah, a lot will just lose their jobs. <coughs> yep. Oh, yeah. civilians certainly will. Well, no, civilians military. Will, so will military lose their jobs? Absolutely yeah, they yeah. will. Yeah. yeah, it happened to us many times before. 
you mean if you wanted to stay 20 years and you, you can't. can, you yep. can go and you yep. can. It depends upon your rate and rank yep. and your what your qualifications uh, are and where you're needed and uh, that as to whether you'll be sent to another yep. duty station or whether you'll be asked to leave the military. They, they have to have at least 18 and a half years to be guaranteed to be allowed to stay 20. But uh, during times like this, usually 15 is the number. And they're offered usually an early retirement yeah. package. It's not great. They won't get the full 20 year but retirement how many package, military, but they'll get a retirement package. How many package. people are in our total military? Do you know that? Of the, in the country? In Probably. the country? Well, yeah, they say it's 1% of the 320 million. Well, we're, we're 550 in, in the Army, Army, and that's the biggest service. Okay. So, uh, and, and don't forget the National Guard and the Reserve. They are considered. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. But I th we're about 1.5 million, I think, is the number. Yeah. Okay, that's what I <laughs> is this what they did uh, with El Toro, uh, California? R remind me, wasn't that Marines? El Toro, yeah. I don't know. El Toro's Marines. It is Marines. Yeah. yeah. We didn't they repurpose that? Uh, yeah, El, uh, there was a, a whole bunch during the, the, a lot of California bases closed uh, in the 1990s uh, because of this. And uh, Norton Air Force Base, um, yeah, but El Toro I remember, yeah. It, and, and the Marines and the, and the Navy and the Air, Air Force have to cut too, but their cuts on Oahu are, are Manini. Yeah. And that's because they're strategic. Okay, other questions? Well, all right, if you have other questions, please email me or call me. I'm available. Uh, I'm also doing this again on the October 14th at the um, YNI Dis uh, Dis District Park. And you're welcome to come there as well, especially for moral support. <laughs> and uh, oh, wait, let me give you a time frame here. What what the you, so I already told you that the environmental assessment has been uh, uh, responded to, and so the Army is reviewing all the comments to their environmental assessment. And by the way, for all 19 states, the environmental assessment found no no findings of uh, uh, Fonzie finding of no significant. Uh, impact for anybody, yeah, for, 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 for us level. or anybody, for for every one of the 19 states, it was a FONSI findings and no sig significant uh, impact. They did mention it's an economic impact on everybody equally, but uh, but for you know it was an environmental assessment, so the economic piece wasn't as important as the environmental piece. All right, but that though they're reviewing those findings now. I challenge, I called up U.S. Army Garrison and says, I'd like to have a, a public debate with you. And Don Chang, I don't know if you know her, but she was, she agreed to facilitate it pro bono. But unfortunately, the Army locally declined and referred me to the Department of the Army. Uh, but they did tell me that, uh, they did tell me that Department of the Army will be out, and it's actually the Army Environmental Command below Department of the Army, will be coming out in January or February to do sensing sessions. So that's when I need you again. Mm -hmm. yep. And we need, I don't know if you watched or participated in the Department of Interior hearings where everybody came out and told the Department of Interior, leave us alone, go away. We want the same thing to happen with this, which will be a huge shock to, the, to who comes and does this because in the other 18 states, they're all gonna get on their knees and say, oh, don't, don't leave us, we are, you're too important. They're gonna, yeah, anyways. So that's in January, February. So then, in the, then after that and in the spring, there'll be recommendations made to Congress and there'll be private meetings, closed door meetings, all of the people with power at DC will actually do horse trading and decide who loses and who wins. Did you say that again, January or February, what do you need us to come to? You know, when, when, when there'll be uh, some hearings locally in the community. Uh, Environmental hearings. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you had a question. Uh, uh, comment, one, one minor, okay. minor thing. Uh, uh, <coughs> I'm all for a college there, but not in place of, but in addition to. Oh, what? Uh, you know, you were talking about the college. It's an idea. Yeah, yeah. an idea. Okay, the, uh, uh, the West Branch is great, yeah. and I think it's okay. wonderful, and I think it's going to expand, and it's going to be a, a worldwide draw, probably. And so, not in place of, but in addition to, I think, 
that would be another college. Sure. A campus. And, and it could be a private school. It could, you know, unfortunately, HPU is expanding to uh, the Aloha Tower market, but imagine HPU being here, or or any any private. Absolutely. Like Tokimiki Alani or yeah. uh, Honolulu. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it wouldn't hurt Leeward Community College to have a. Oh, they 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 uh, have, have a campus here that's fairly familiar with English and British. Yeah, but it wouldn't hurt to have a community college on the old Schofield. Yes. Like like an agriculture campus or something. Yeah. You know. Like a Davis. Yeah. We really could use a veterinary and agricultural school here, mm -hmm. yeah. or a school of architecture, or there are just many, many different things that could happen. Well, so two feeds right into it. So, so uh, one of the other things, and what I was going to tell you is, uh, when the meeting in these closed doors at in Washington and deciding which states win and which lose, this is where I and you know, I'm told. Schatz's office this last week and want to tell the others is this is where you go in and say behind closed doors look we're willing to take bite the bullet on uh, army forces in Oahu but I'm going to be a, a congressman in Hawaii for a long time and I want your support and I want a relationship with you so when they come after the Navy or the Marines or the Air Force I want your back but use this as leverage as political leverage don't use, don't fight them and lose, but use this as leverage. Um, but decisions will probably be made on this, and there'll be delays. This, you know, one of the tactic on these kind of things is delays. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised before twenty, the end of twenty fifteen, that it's announced who who the winners and lo losers are. I wouldn't doubt it one bit because that's how fast court orders happen. So yeah. you need to act fast. Well, I, but also in that negotiation, there should be okay. We want. Yeah. This transitional uh, assistance package. As well, this yeah, yeah. assistance package as well yeah. as these plans. Yeah, that's where I can use your help on the networking and calling your senators and, and congresspersons. Is say use this as an opportunity to get this package. Yeah, don't fight it. Waste your time fighting for a package. Yeah, and, and I have another question that maybe you that's all up to your president. I'm here all um, day. What what um, what impact would it have for people? from other states to be writing their congressmen about. The, and they I'm are. From Hawaii. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, they probably, uh, it's getting, you know, Maybe. getting to them to tell them to do that. They, w they wouldn't even think of that. Maybe what we could offer is the office's housing to uh, give to the congressmen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's where I can network as a newcomer. I mean, that other people, oh, okay. yeah, other people in other states. Well, I, I tell you that that uh, the uh, the other states are they have call to actions. They are organized. They are fighting this big. And because it isn't in our news, and because we don't have this happening, yeah. that's a good thing. That's it, a good it's thing. It's very positive. Yeah, the fact no one's fighting this is a is a positive thing. The only there's only been. Like I said, there was been one TV interview that we did. Uh, it was Monday of this week. Yeah, I was on TV Monday, yeah, Monday. And, and and so was Sco um, Waihua. Yeah. And uh, there was a newspaper article, and that's it. Has it been in the Star Advertiser? Or Once. An article. Only one, well, and one op-ed. And, and and that was only six responses to that yeah. op-ed. Oh yeah, and, and and that's so unusual that the Star Advertiser even took it off of their website. Yeah. Wow. Really? Which they never do. They yeah. leave it on. They usually at least a week. <laughs> Thank you very much for the time. Again, I'm available all the time. So, okay. Aloha to you.